Hi, I'm Tom Hederly, Senior Writer at the American Hospital Association. This podcast series is part of the Value Initiative, which highlights steps hospitals are taking to improve affordability and value for their patients and communities. These members have implemented strategies that enhance the patient experience, improve quality, or lower costs. In this Members in Action podcast, we'll focus on Cedars-Sinai Medical Center's age-friendly efforts. This includes the use of the 4Ms framework in their geriatric fracture program and its integration in telemedicine during the COVID-19 pandemic. Joining Aisha Sayeda, program manager at the AHA, is Dr. Sonia Rosen, who serves as chief for the section of geriatric medicine, and Kathleen Breda, nurse practitioner lead, both with Cedars-Sinai Medical Center. Thank you, Tom, for that introduction. Dr. Rosen and Kathy, you've had successes, success in implementing the forums framework in your geriatric fracture program. Dr. Rosen, can you talk a little bit about why this was important to Cedar sinai Absolutely. As we know, the baby boomers are aging in and the population in the United States over the age of 65 Um, is going to more than double uh, by 2030, which is less than 10 years away. And we are actually seeing that acutely at Cedars-Sinai, Cedars-Sinai Medical Center has more patients over the age of 80 than any other academic tertiary health care system in the country. So we have a great need to um, optimize models of care for our geriatric population. We also know with that huge growth in patients over the age of 65 that we will never have enough geriatricians, per se, to directly provide care for all of our um, older patients. So we really look for models of care that work with other disciplines to implement um, optimal geriatric models of care. So at Cedars-Sinai, the Geriatric Fracture Program is really Um, a model, an exemplary model of how different disciplines across the health system collaborate and implement geriatric models of care with non-geriatricians. For example, um, in this program, our geriatricians trained three different hospital services uh, to um, complete optimal perioperative geriatric care for our geriatric fracture patients. Another example of that is how uh, in geriatrics we work with our primary care physicians to screen for fall risk um, and recognize uh, risk factors for falls. Thank you, Dr. Rosen, for providing that context. Kathy, can you talk a little bit about the process of implementing the 4M framework for that program? Sure, I'd be happy to. So the 4Ms are really a a wonderful paradigm to ensure focus on key areas of importance for our older adult patients. And we work with a multidisciplinary group to care for these patients here at Cedars-Sinai. These are patients who are 65 and older and have sustained a fracture, typically a fragility fracture. As far as Uh, the 4Ms, what matters, medication, mentation, and mobility. You know, uh, when we look at what matters to the patient, we want to understand what's important to them so that we can integrate it into our patient's care. And we discuss this when we're doing our daily huddles so that we align the patient's goals and and safe and good care for them as well. Uh, As far as medications go, we take a very close look at what medications the patient has been taking prior to hospitalization and also a close look at their inpatient medications. You know, there are often multiple clinicians prescribing and we want to ensure that there is kind of a geriatric centric oversight where we look at um, medications from the standpoint of the Beers criteria and we look at the anticholinergic burden which could, you know, uh, contribute to falls and, and delirium. And we also look at interactions in polypharmacy. And one of the benefits we have here is 
working very closely with our pharmacists and our attending physicians to to assess the patient's uh, uh, medication situation. And in regards to mentation, we've done extensive training with our nurses on the unit where most of these patients are housed, but so they understand uh, what dementia is all about, what delirium is all about, and how to care for these patients in a way that's going to uh, hopefully improve their outcomes. Uh, and um, we also assess these patients for uh, cognitive impairment, so we understand how we need to converse and educate them and their family members as well as they go through the hospitalization process. Um, and lastly, mobility is a, a very important part of the care for these patients because many of these patients came to us because they had mobility issues and they unfortunately uh, often had a ground level fall. So we take a very close look at what the patient's pre-injury uh, falls, mobility, and self-care statuses, and we coordinate these findings with our therapy team and, and hopefully put together a, a plan that will bring the patient back to a level of functionality that, that meets their needs going forward. Wonderful. Um, Dr. Rosen, with COVID-19, hospitals have had to make lots of changes to their processes. How are you using the four M's in your telehealth visits? Yeah, thank you uh, for that great question. Um, in geriatrics, in our ambulatory care practice, we really try to um, incorporate the four M's into each visit. So transitioning rather abruptly in March to telehealth visits um, really, you know, uh, was, was an abrupt learning curve, how, you know, how to incorporate the four M's into virtual care. Um, and what we found was we, we can be very successful at it. And in fact, in some ways, virtual health actually lends itself better. And I'll give you a few examples. Almost all patients and our caregivers have the ability to talk on the phone. And so we found that having those crucial conversations about what matters most with the patient and their family or uh, friend, person that's closest to them or durable power of attorney was actually often easier uh, because we didn't have the um, uh, challenges of distance and arranging for everyone to be in the same place at the same time. We could easily conference call people together uh, during the visit. Um, we also had the option to video conference um, family members into the phone call. So in many circumstances, we found it uh, more, uh, we actually found uh, it uh, easier, more efficient to have those conversations with virtual care. Um, we also, both our physicians and our geriatric pharmacists, um, have long been reviewing medications on the phone. Um, however, being able to see the patient's medications really uh, heightened this ability um, where we were able to actually see that the patient was or wasn't taking the medication that they reported. Um, another example of how telehealth really heightened uh, this ability was informed decision-making. So we, we needed to have thoughtful conversations um, on the phone or on video prior to deciding the necessity of a person coming to the emergency room um, or being admitted to the hospital or coming for an in-person visit to the urgent care based on their symptoms. Being able to have those conversations on the phone and conference in, um, or at the, I mean, perhaps the family member was there at the same time with the iPhone, having that conversation together in person with the patient, but being able to do that all together really strengthened our confidence in the informed decision-making process rather than having one call here and one call there. Um, and so again, we felt that this actually was, you know, possibly done better with telehealth versus our traditional office model. And then, you know, finding a time when everyone would be, when different family members would be available to have those conversations. Of course, a lot of 
family members are also working from home. So that added to their accessibility and their availability, um, as well as patients who are still working, people who are still at home, are now at home because of the pandemic, or at least through the first, you know, several months of the pandemic, and that accessibility made it easier to have those conversations. And the next one is access. Um, in terms of mobility, um, uh, access is often um, an issue in terms of being able to be evaluated. Well, with virtual health, access really isn't the issue because we're able to have those um, meetings in the home on either the phone or the video. And then the ability to um, conference call, as I mentioned, helped with what matters most. It helped with reviewing medications, but it also helped with mentation because we were able to get corroborating information from family members, caregivers in real time um, and assess if a patient might be delirious and have an altered level of consciousness. And lastly, our patients love to feel connected. Um, they were very appreciative of that immediate contact and access to their physician during um, the you know, very frightening uh, first few months of the pandemic. Um, and that really, we saw that on our patient satisfaction sur surveys that they really felt very connected um, to um, our physicians by being essentially just a phone call away. The only added benefits of the video visits to the telephone visits is the uh, visual benefit of being able to do a virtual physical exam and assess mobility and mentation um, visibly, um, which, which is very, very uh, doable and as long as there's a uh, person nearby to make sure that the patient is safe when they're evaluated. And the visual review of the medications I mentioned uh, by physicians and pharmacists where we can you know, uh, visually verify that patients are taking the medications that they, they say they're taking. That's, um, that's wonderful. And having to do that so quickly uh, during the midst of a pandemic is, uh, is exceptional. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Rosen. Kathy, we know that implementing the forms framework can impact patient outcomes, patient experience, and cost. Can you talk a little bit about what types of outcomes you've seen since implementing the geriatric factor program? Sure, I'd be happy to. So we developed the geriatric program, the geriatric fracture program, based on uh, the American College of Surgeons National Surgical Quality Improvement Program and American <clears throat> Geriatric Society guidelines to make sure that we were following well-known and accepted protocols. Uh, and we also had a multidisciplinary group of Cedars-Sinai physicians, uh, nurses, pharmacists, case managers, uh, uh, and we all, and I should say therapists as well, physical and occupational therapists, so that we could discuss what makes this program work or will work within CEDARS. So based on what we developed, we were able to see improvements in our patients' care. We, our goal was to optimize the outcomes of our patients so that they could get back to the life and the quality of life that was important to them. And what we saw by implementing this program after the first year is that we were able to get patients to surgery faster utilizing the protocols of this program than prior to the program being implemented. And the improvement was over 40% in, uh, improvement of time. And that meant that patients weren't waiting for surgery. They had thus fewer uh, complications. It also meant that they most likely would be spending fewer days in the hospital. And we know that the longer someone stays in the hospital, there's a higher risk of having complications. So we actually were able to reduce our patient's length of stay as compared to prior to this program by more than 10%. By doing these two uh, uh, by meeting these two goals, 
uh, in, uh, improving time to surgery and reducing length of stay, we also saw a decrease in direct costs of patient's care, which was uh, over 12% um, a decrease in care costs. Those were direct care costs. Those are the costs that we can uh, affect by implementing quality improvement. Now, that's all well and good. However, if your patient then leaves and then comes back quickly uh, with another complication, then you haven't done anything remarkable. But what we saw is that our patients were not coming back. They were not readmitting. So we feel that we've really improved the patient. Uh, we've been able to improve the care of our patient in a way that um, not only helps them, but also helps the hospital as a whole. I think also that the patients and their families really appreciate that we spend time with them, we discuss what's going on in the hospital, what to expect, and then we talk about the transition of care out of the hospital back to home or rehab, and we're very fortunate to be able to work with uh, the Division of Geriatrics, uh, Dr. Rosen's group, where we can provide wraparound care to these patients to do a full geriatric assessment for falls and other things like uh, bone health uh, once they've discharged from the hospital. So hopefully we can reduce the number of these patients returning for, to us for similar injuries. Those are, some, those are some great outcomes. Dr. Rosen, do you have any early results from integrating the forums in the telehealth budget? Uh, sure, and, and just to add to um, Kathy's uh, wonderful uh, description of, of our program outcomes, um, for our, we, we uh, see the patients who have been enrolled in the geriatric fracture program in our outpatient geriatric practice for bone health and fall prevention um, assessment. Um, and so patients who um, have had, have sustained a fracture and are now back um, at home in, the com in their community, they will then come in and will assess their risk for falls, their balance and their gait, and um, assess their bone health, um, which often involves initiating uh, medications for osteoporosis. In terms of our telehealth visits, um, we have um, really only formally measured our productivity um, as well as patient satisfaction. And we haven't just maintained that through telehealth, we actually um, mm -hmm. exceeded our, our prior performance. And there's certainly a lot of reasons for that um, in terms of patient demand um, and again, that improved access. So all, all of that has been positive. We are at this juncture um, really um, trying to see more and more patients face to face. But I will share that there are patients who don't feel comfortable coming in to see us yet in person. And often that's because they lack a private vehicle to access our offices. And so um, they may have previously relied on access or the public transportation or um, a, a, you know, Lyft service such as Uber or Lyft, um, and they're not comfortable being in that shared space um, for safety, and they may be high risk for COVID complications. And so they're choosing to continue to be homebound, and that's safer for them. And for those patients, we will continue um, the telehealth visits, but we do feel uh, we 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 are are we are very confident that our offices are safe, and so we're really encouraging our patients who are ambulatory and who can come in now to um, come in for face-to-face -face visits. But for those patients who um, have um, continued mobility issues, those issues, those types of issues that I just mentioned, and also for patients who just need follow-up and um, who might not necessitate a face-to-face -face visit, the telehealth option uh, remains a really important uh, viable option for our patients. 
what were some of the challenges um, you both have experienced throughout this process, whether it's for the geriatric factor program or for the telehealth visit? Well, I'll take telehealth first, and then I'll turn things over to Kathy for the geriatric fracture program. Um, our our biggest challenge uh, for the telehealth communications um, really has been patients' access to um, uh, the ability to have a video visit. Uh, so, as I as I mentioned earlier, most patients have a telephone. And I would say 98% of patients um, can have a telephone visit, whether it's with them or their caregiver or family member. Um, but a much smaller percentage of patients um, have the um, technology um, to have a video visit. And so learning what, learning what patients were able to do was a big challenge. Um, a lot of patients felt that they could not have a video visit. They wouldn't understand how to use it. But after talking with them and, you know, getting uh, them comfortable with the idea, perhaps they had an iPhone and perhaps they're used to FaceTiming their family members and they realized a video visit with a physician would be just as simple as a FaceTime visit with their family members. It seemed less daunting and they got comfortable with it. So a lot of patients in the beginning of the pandemic who didn't think that was an option for them later got comfortable with it. Um, it does remain a barrier though, um, not being able, not having the technology to have a video visit. So if you don't have a smartphone um, it's re or a, a computer, it's really not possible, um, or an iPad rather, an iPad, smartphone, or a computer, um, having video visits isn't possible. And so there we really um, stick with telephone visits for those patients that still require uh, virtual visits. The other part that was challenging, interestingly enough, um, was patients not wanting to have phone visits in the beginning of the pandemic because they didn't really understand its value. But after they had spoken to the physician and understood that, in fact, an entire visit could be completed on the phone with that, minus the physical exam if the video portion wasn't available, they got really comfortable with that um, and um, had many more phone visits at their request. Okay. What about you from your perspective? Um, sure. What have been some lessons learned? So what's been interesting for us is developing a program within an environment that has many, it's very complex. There are many different uh, groups that take care of patients and they're independent although they do somewhat overlap as we care for our patients through the day, but they are independent hospitalist groups and other types of physicians within the medical center. So one of the things that was interesting and difficult for us was to, prov it was to develop a program that would be successful in a very complex environment. We call it a pluralistic environment. We were able to do this by developing the program in a pilot, uh, a, a pilot manner um, for the first about year and then expanding it to other similar uh, practice groups, the hospitalist groups within the hospital. Uh, and that has worked quite well. That We over-communicate probably, and that's part of the reason why we've been successful because people know what is going on and they know what the expectations are. And now we have uh, entered our second year of the program and we are looking very, or our third year actually, but we're looking very closely at how we can uh, continue to expand the program uh, to other uh, other groups within Cedar Sinai who would benefit from the focused geriatric care that's provided. Thank you. As far as future goal, goals or next steps, how do you? Uh, see the program growing and evolving, um, especially from a telehealth, telemedicine perspective. Dr. Rosen, can you share? Absolutely, and that's a great question and one we are sort of constantly on a daily basis as things evolve assessing, um, to be quite honest. Um, again, we're really encouraging our patients to come in now for face-to-face -face visits at Cedar sinai 
our um, offices are safe um, and um, we're, you know, completely confident um, in the safety of seeing our patients in the office. That said, um, uh, uh, there may be a variety of reasons that patients choose not to come into the office um, and for whom telehealth really remains um, the, the most viable, viable way of accessing care. Um, for example, a patient who has um, uh, mobility issues um, for whom it is you know, challenging to come into the office and that that's a barrier for care. Um, a patient who doesn't have access to a private vehicle who would re- previously have relied on public transportation, but because of the health concerns with the pandemic, uh, wouldn't feel comfortable using public transportation or an access transportation vehicle and doesn't have access to a private vehicle, that patient uh, might understandably not feel safe coming in um, uh, to the offices. And then there, there are patients that live far away or patients for whom the visit might not necessarily necessitate an in-person evaluation. So for all those reasons, telehealth really remains um, a great um, tool for being able to provide real-time care for our patients. And we um, absolutely intend to continue using it for um, all of those um, different circumstances. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosen and Kathy, for your thoughts. For more podcasts and additional resources to help you promote value in your community, please visit the Value Initiative's website at www.aha.org slash thevalueinitiative. Thanks for listening.